So I'll be talking about the first two topics today of research for um, the SRP. And the first topic is on the transnational business empire of the Hopar brothers. In 1800s, Ao Chu Kin left Fujian for Rangoon to set up his own physician practice and he opened Eng Un Tong, or the Hall of Everlasting Peace. Upon his passing in 1908, he passes down his business to his two sons, Ao Bun Ho and Ao Bun Pa. Three years later, the two sons opened Eng Un Tong's first overseas branch in Bangkok. In 1926, Ao Bun Ho moves to Singapore, opens a factory, and opens a medical hall. In 1950, he sets up a bank with other Hakka merchants and becomes its chairman. Ao Bun Ho, besides, of course, being the one of the co-founders of the Tiger Bomb business, is known for three other things. The first is his news business. He set up a newspaper in most of the cities in which he had business operations in. And this was, of course, used to advertise Tiger Bomb products, but also to publicize his own acts of giving. A well-known philanthropist in the Chinese community, he funded disaster relief in China and the construction of military hospitals and mental asylums, etc. More controversially, he was known for forging political connections with opposing political entities in China in the 1930s and 40s, often at the same time. The nationalists considered him old friends, the communists considered him a kind and noble man, and during the Japanese occupation, he actually met up with the Japanese government. After his passing in 1954, the business was handed down to his nephew, Ao Ching Chai. In 1969, Ching Chai incorporated the family business into Ha Par Brothers International Limited, and the same year it entered the stock exchange. In 1971, he handed control of the company over to Slater Walker Securities, a British company, who divested many of Ha Par's major operating businesses. From 71 to 73, Slater Walker executives used subsidiaries to buy Hong Kong stocks and sell them to a company owned by themselves so that they could obtain the profit. And the Singapore government pursued these actions in court, and the director of the company, Jim Richard Tarling was extradited to Singapore and imprisoned. Hopar throughout this ordeal suffered losses and a new board was appointed after to put things back in order. In conclusion, when we look back at the legacy of the Hopar brothers today, there's nothing that encapsulates it more than these two buildings, a Hopar villa in Singapore and Hopar mansion in Hong Kong. They are consist of private residences and public gardens for the Ao family in these locations. And the public garden in particular was used to promote Tiger Bomb products uh, provide a Chinese cultural education through statues for the public and provide an open recreational space for the Chinese public, which was a rarity in the colonial times. These two buildings stand today as a kind of heritage and cultural sites to remember uh, the two brothers and the impact that they had in Asia. The second topic I'll be touching on is on the relations between Vietnam and the USSR slash Eastern Bloc. So the first way in which I investigated the links between the two um, kind of regions is, Viet is this product called Vietnam Bomb, which is very, very similar to Tiger Bomb in its ingredients. Uh, there was an influx of Vietnamese staying in Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, which led to an exchange of goods. The Vietnamese bought Eastern European goods, such as soap and motorcycles, and sent them home in packages. In exchange, they left behind this ointment called Gold Star Ointment, also known as Vietnam Bomb. Uh, it was introduced when, in the early days of relations, about the 1950s, the Vietnamese would enter the USSR and at department stores they would barter uh, their gold star ointments, like bottles of it, to buy irons, kettles, and pots, etc. And the reason why there were so many Vietnamese in Eastern Europe was a result of many formal agreements to bring them over to uh, pick up skills vocationally that were required to uh, implement Vietnam's five-year plan which was focused on heavy industry and also to uh, serve the Vietnam economy in its post-war reconstruction. However, with the economic slump of the 1980s, the Eastern European countries tried to turn these agreements uh, to their own advantage instead of focusing on um, supplying manpower to revive their stagnating industries. And eventually, most of these agreements were terminated upon the collapse of the Berlin Wall. Similarly, the Eastern European presence in Vietnam was very large from the 50s to the 80s. It comprised of sending medical teams to improve on the infrastructure and build more hospitals, and especially uh, after the Vietnam War to uh, rebuild Vietnamese cities. For example, you can see a residential complex that was built, designed by GDR planners and built um, by, by workers from the GDR. So as you can see through these two topics, that there are a wealth of intercontinental connections. That, that actually defy our expectations and um, introduce complexity into the narrative that we know as the Cold War.
For my part, my approach was to pick broad topics and cast a wide net to dig up novel avenues of inquiry. One such topic was the foreign trade of the Eastern Bloc, which entailed trotting through a wide collection of thought pieces and reports written by political, academic and business leaders, both from the Eastern Bloc as well as outsiders who dealt directly with them through the 60s to 90s. I then compiled some of the niche concerns and issues within this broad field. One of the most prominent concerns for the Eastern Bloc was the improvement of the export numbers. Eager for knowledge and relatively outmatched by Western corporations in the global market, companies within the Socialist Bloc often sought out the best practices of fellow socialist state enterprises who were successful at increasing their foreign exports. These practices range from the technical, such as those regarding marketing and computer modeling techniques, to more radical changes within the company's incentive system, thus providing insight into the changing practices and philosophies of Eastern Bloc enterprises. In 1965, for example, the Hungarian company United Inc. and Desenbalk experimented with an export gains sharing system. This rewarded individual factory units based on the amount of foreign exports, rather than the profitability of the entire company. This successfully boosted foreign exports within its pilot year and marked one of the first times that differentiated income according to merit was introduced in Hungarian factories of the kind and led to calls for greater expansion of similar systems within the country. Additionally, I explored trade between the Eastern and Western blocs in hope of finding eventual links to Asia. One noteworthy entity is Union Carbide, a chemical processing company from the United States recognized as a pioneer into East-West collaboration. Union Carbide's detailed and candid reports provided a rich source of information as they related their business ventures in the Eastern Bloc during the late 1960s. These reports spelled out some of the problems they encountered, such as a lack of trust arising from different educational backgrounds, and the difficulties of dealing with state monopolies in the Eastern Bloc as an individual company. While they tried to deal with some of these problems directly, by inviting Soviet representatives over to the US for social visits, for example, they also relied heavily on intermediaries such as the Indian government, which I will discuss a bit more later on. Finally, I looked at foreign trade between the Eastern Bloc and the so-called developing world. In light of the Cold War, the Eastern Bloc viewed their engagement with the developing world through the lens of both pragmatic concerns as well as ideological reasons such as the need to assist the developing world in resisting the economic control of the West. We will take a look at South Korea and India today, which featured very prominently in Eastern Bloc literature on foreign trade. South Korea is interesting because she was viewed as a sort of model country by Eastern European countries during the 70s and 80s who wanted to emulate her economic success while retaining a largely authoritarian one-party political system. South Korea concurrently felt compelled to develop her trade relations with the East due to unfavorable trading conditions with the West, such as the gradual imposition of trade tariffs by the US on South Korean goods during this time period to counteract trade deficits in Korea's favor. South Korea thus enacted North politic or Northern policy during the 70s and 80s, which made explicit her desire to engage in reciprocal and mutually beneficial economic relations with all nations, regardless of ideological differences. These efforts culminated in the Soviet Union's media portraying South Korea as a fully independent state rather than a mere puppet of the United States. As well as in the success of Operation 5% in 1990, where President Roe became the first president of South Korea to have a summit with the leader of the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev. We also took a step at cataloging the various ways in which South Korea and the Eastern Bloc developed and maintained a working relationship while being estranged politically. Sports for One provided an opportunity for the Eastern Bloc to coordinate their approach to South Korea in a subtle manner. This could be seen when sports ministers from across the Eastern Bloc met in Vietnam in 1985 and agreed to attend the 1988 Seoul Olympics, regardless of any protests or suggested boycott from fellow socialist state North Korea. This thus gave a sense of assurance to one another that they would not run afoul of the socialist bloc by being friendly with South Korea. In South Korea's end, she also utilized her local corporations to spearhead economic collaboration with Hyundai and Lucky Gold Star, or LG as it is known today, being encouraged by local authorities to undertake construction and development projects in Russia, especially the Far East during the late 1980s. Lastly, India both saw the Eastern Bloc as a marketplace where they could gain experience before entering more competitive Western market and also provided an intermediary service to Western companies who struggled to deal with the Eastern Bloc on their own right. As mentioned, Western companies such as Union Carbide sometimes struggled to deal with Eastern Bloc countries as trade there was conducted by state monopolies which wielded a lot more bargaining power relative to themselves. Furthermore, many Western companies lacked their expertise or connections in dealing with politicians in the Eastern Bloc which India then offered to provide in return for payments in foreign currency and technical knowledge. These relationships sometimes develop in great depth as well, with Union Carbide using India as a manufacturing base before export into Eastern Europe. They even got involved in the stream exporting business at the request of the Indian government in order to assist in bringing in more foreign currency. Now, 
There's certainly a lot more that Grace and I would love to share with you, but we're going to close for now as we're out of time and we look forward to engaging with you in the Q&A session.